Hello everyone. Today we are with another lecture in the subject literary criticism. And today we will discuss the first English critic Sir Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney was a multifaceted person. He was a soldier, he was a courtier, he was a statesman, he was a diplomat, he was a poet, he was a critic. But today we will discuss Philip Sidney as the critic. So Philip Sidney he defended the poetry in his work an apology for poetry. But why he defended poetry? What happened before him? There was a person his name was uh, Stephen Gosan. Stephen Gosan was a playwright and he was a poet but later on he became a puritan and he went against poet and poetry so stephen gosan wrote a booklet and that booklet was named as the school of abuse and in the school of abuse he raised charges against poetry and interestingly he dedicated this book to uh, Philip Sidney without the permission of Philip Sidney. So we will discuss what were the charges raised by Stephen Gosan and how did Sir Philip Sidney defend the poetry. Let's begin our today's topic defense of poetry by Sir Philip Sidney. So here is the first charge against poetry by Stephen Gosan and his followers. They say poetry consists of rhyming and versification. So there is rhyming scheme and there is meter and rhythm in poetry. That's why they went against poetry. And they think that poetry makes us morally corrupt. So how did Philip Sidney defend this charge? Let's see. Sidney replies. Answer 1. He says they are not necessary. What is not necessary? Rhyming and versification. So according to Sidney, that rhyming and meter are not the essential part of poetry. We can have poetry without rhyming and without versification if the concept is poetical, if the thought is gradual. So for poetry, what is necessary? That is poetical concept. That is Grangeville thought, not rhyme and meter. That's why that he said they are not necessary. So he thinks that we can have a poetry without rhyme and without versification. And sometimes we have poetry, people call it poetry. There is rhyme and there is meter. But in fact, it's not poetry because the concept is not Grangeville, right? And the second answer he gives is they add to delight and beauty even if like rhyme and versification exists in poetry what's the problem because they add delight and they add beauty to poetry so if something adds beauty to something how it can be wrong how it can be bad let's see its explanation first charge and reply the first charge is rather a strange one they said that poetry is bad because it is bound up with rhyming and versification. What they thought was that meter and verse was not good. Sidney says that meter and rhyme are not necessary for poetry. It's not meter and rhyme that make poetry. It is just like a dress. Mm, it's very interesting. That rhyme and rhythm or rhyme and versification, they are just like a dress. And if you dress something so it looks more elegant, more beautiful, so what's the problem? Right? Then he uh, makes an analogy that a man cannot become a lawyer just wearing the gown of lawyer. If you are not a lawyer and you wear the gown of a lawyer, you are not a lawyer. You, you can't go to the court because you don't have a license. And even if you do not wear a gown and you have a license of poetry, okay, or you have a license of the law, uh, still you are a lawyer, right? Let me give you another example. That if a person wears 
like a doctor dress or having a stethoscope. A, a person cannot become a doctor. And even if a person does not wear a doctor dress and having no stethoscope, still we call him a doctor if he is having a degree, if he is or she is a specialist. So he said that a man cannot become a lawyer just wearing the gown of a lawyer. On the other hand, if a lawyer does not wear gown, even he is a lawyer. Whatever poet's right is poetical, if the conception is poetical, even if there is no rhyme and meter, still we call it a good poetry. And he gives the example of Plato, that whatever Plato wrote, it was not in meter, it was not in rhythm, it was not in rhyme, but still he is one of the greatest poet of all times. Now here we will continue the same argument. On the contrary, if the conception is not poetical, even verse form using meter and rhyme will not be poetry. So we see that around us today that people make poetry or people write poetry and there is rhyme and there is rhythm, there is meter and there is rhyming. But still it's not poetry because the concept is not grandual. So poetry is not versification but imitation what should be. Aristotle uses words what might be or what ought to be. And here that Sidney used the word should be. Actually that the replies of Sidney is a kind of synthesis of Aristotle, Longinus, Horace, right? And he gives, gives it a new whole. So it is a representation of what should be the poet is an inspired man. He gets inspiration from somewhere else and he or she produces poetry. As a Roman said, Roman said that uh, a poet is an inspired man. So the poet is creator that said by Greek thought. So on the one hand, if Roman said that poet is an inspired man, Horace is there. On the other hand, that poet is a creator, Aristotle is there. If the writing is inspiring, it is poetry. Sydney has given many examples of work which were not written in verse, but still it's poetry. I told you the example is Plato. The Plato Republic is written in uh, not in like a rhythm and verse form, but still the concept is grand jewel, right? The thought is grand jewel. The, the, the concept is poetical, so it is considered poetry. So Sidney considered Plato to be a poet because he is the great admirer of Plato. His dialogue are not in verse form, they are genuine poetry. Similarly, they, there are many versification who are not poet. Right? There are uh, many versifications who are not poet. Therefore, the objection of critic does not apply to poetry as much but against versification and uh, uh, rhyming, so which are not essential for poetry. So this was the first charge and the reply of Sir Philip Sidney. Sidney reply, second reply to the same charge. The second reply to the same charge is why should meter and rhythm be considered wrong? Because they aid beauty and delight to something. So the greatest gift of God to man is the reasoning power. We use our reason, right? We use argument. So man is also gifted with the power of expressing his thought in words. We have reason and we express our thought by using words. And if we use to, to express those thoughts in rhyme and rhythm, so we give more delight we give more beauty to those words. Isn't it good to make the gift of God more delightful, more beautiful? So rhyming and meter makes, makes uh, the gift more beautiful and elegant. It makes the gift of God more appealing. Why should then it be considered bad? Meter is verbal harmony. It is always a source of delight. He says versification give order and balance to writing and uh, those are the characteristic of beauty. So if something gives harmony and order to something, so these are the characteristics of beauty, right? So uh, as a result, if one writes in 
words form uh, uh, and his writing will become more beautiful above all meter and rhyme give to one's writing a sense and emotional quality something which makes the gift of god more beautiful and delightful cannot be called bad this is the second answer to the same uh, objection so we can summarize this that uh, the greatest gift of god to human being is the power of reasoning right we have thought and we express those thoughts by using words so words are just like a dress so if we use like rhyme and rhythm okay to express our thoughts in more elegant way more dignified way so how can something which make the gift of god more elegant more delightful be bad right so he says that uh, rhyme and rhythm are not essential for poetry but even if they exist so they add beauty to the thought to the poetical conception so that this is okay the second reply are uh, to the same charge the second charge of gosan and his follower was that poetry is waste of time by reading poetry we waste a lot of time we can spend our time by reading some useful subject like chemistry mathematics biology astronomy philosophy but if we read poetry so it waste our time so how did sydney defend this charge let's see sydney replied they answer to that proof better that poetry proof better itself than other subjects other discipline and it's like a milk okay when we say milk so it means okay that other disciplines and other subjects nourish by uh, this poetry right so it's like a kind of feed for other subject and it came it comes before other so poetry comes before all other subjects if that is chemistry that is biology that is philosophy whatever is there so first come poetry you see okay there in uh, 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 any culture or in any civilization first emerge poetry and then other things and suppress other uh, uh, and superpass other knowledges right it superpasses what poetry uh, superpasses all other kind of knowledges you see um uh, the example of aristotle plato horace right so first they talk about poetry and importance is given to poetry so this knowledge comes before all other knowledges let's see detail of this reply second objection as a reading of poetry is complete waste of time who said gosan and his followers time is limited and there are more useful subject to study so sydney again does not take this chart very seriously and he asks what are other subjects which are more useful he says what is more useful than poetry right because science is not useful chemistry is not useful mathematics is not useful they are useful but not more useful than poetry because poetry it reconstruct things you imagine thing right so he has already proof that poetry has surpassed all other subject how a subject can which morally elevate person so mathematics does not evaluate you right chemistry does not evaluate you no subject evaluate you morally except poetry so poetry evaluates person which purify his soul and which is more moral inspiration so no other subject can make you morally purify so how it can be bad then so this is the second reply poetry came before the other branches of knowledge philosophy history astronomy so poetry is a life giver like mother milk right so it nourishes other subject it comes before all other subjects gosan third charge gosan and his followers third charge the third charge is poetry is bunch of lies and poetry poets are liars so poets are liars and whatever they produce that is lie that's why they reject poetry so poetry is falsehood the poets write about 
that which has never happened. Yes, right? And they have no truth in them. So they claim that the poets write about something which has never happened, right? And there is no truth in that. History has truth because historian tells us something which has happened. So that is truth. And astronomy has truth because it tells us what something exists. But what the poets write has no truth. So they are lives. So this is the objection of Gosan and his followers. Let's see uh, how did uh, Philip Sidney defend this charge. Sidney reply. Sidney asks what lie is? What a lie is? If someone says that something has happened and has not happened really, then he will be li he will be telling a lie. If I say that I went to Islamabad yesterday and I did not go, I am a lying. If you say something and it did not happen, so it you are lying. You are a liar and you are telling a lie. So this is a lie according to Sydney. To say a train this morning would actually, it has not. It's a lie. If you are telling someone that it, it has rained this morning and it hasn't rained, so you are lying here. When someone claims his statement is true and it turns out a false, we can say that he is lying. Sidney says that the poet does not assert that he is giving factual truth. Right? He's not talking about what has happened or what is, but he's talking about what should, what ought to be, what might be. So he's talking about which has never happened and which does not exist. So the poets are talking about ideal truth, not factual truth. So if you are not talking about that something happened or something exists, then how? You're a liar. How you're lying? For example, Homer does not say that Ulysses really existed. Shakespeare does not say that Hamlet really existed. So if something has not happened, right, and you are not telling people that it happened, then you are lying. So Shakespeare is not telling people that Hamlet existed because Hamlet is a character that is out of his imagination. And the Hamlet exists in ideas, right, in imagination. So if something has not happened, if something does not exist, so you are not telling that. But you are telling what should be, what ought to be, what might be. So then you are not actually lying. No. For the poet, the for the poet, he nothing affirms and therefore never lies. Sidney says because poet poetry does not deal with what has happened or what is, but what should be, what might be, or what ought to be. If you are telling about something, what might be, what should be, what ought to be, so you are talking about probability, possibility, right? And something has not happened, something does not exist. So this is not actually factual truth but you are telling ideal truth. Continue the same reply. As astronomer can lie to say that people live on moon and when we find out the truth that the astronomer is lying because people do not uh, live on moon. So astronomer can lie. Historian can also tell lie. The poet are not concerned with facts and they do not affirm what they say is true. Therefore, they are not liars. So astronomer can lie, scientist can lie, historian can lie because whatever historian narrates, if it did not happen, they are lying. And whatever scientists tell you or astronomer tell you and it does not exist, then they are lying. But a poet does not tell us what exists or what happened. But they deal with what should be, what ought be, what might be. So then they are dealing with ideal truth, not Factual truth. Sidney makes an important distinction between falsehood and fiction. Fiction is something which has never happened but not false. It does not have factual truth. It's something which is it is something which is written out of imagination. The construction of a writer, of a poet, Hamlet, Ulysses, Othello, these are the construction of the mind of the writer, right? And out of imagination. It is not falsehood. It has its own truth, ideal truth, which is different from factual truth. 
in the words of aristotle poetry has the truth of ideal possibility of their things in other words of plato it has the truth of ideas behind the thing sydney is a great admirer of plato so he accept the philosophy of plato for him the truth of poetry is the truth of idea behind the things and idea is higher than the thing idea ideal truth is higher the is higher than the truth of history philosophy or any other subject so that was the third uh, reply or the third defense of the third charge on this slide we will focus gosan's fourth charge against poetry the fourth charge is that poetry makes a man effeminate it fills his mind with sexual fancies critics say that most of the books of poetry are about love which leads to moral corruption therefore the influence is evil so it makes a man effeminate a man loses his masculinity right and he is just like a womanish so it fills with minds with sexual fancies because most of the poetry according to uh, gosan and his follower consist of love this love poetry and it makes a man effeminate and he loses his masculinity right so how did uh, sydney uh, defend this charge let's see sydney reply sydney gave two four answer to this charge he says it is not necessary for poet to write about love because there are numerous themes that poet write about that if a poet writes about love so a poet can be wrong but poetry cannot be wrong it is same as said by plato and it is said as reply as reply by aristotle because plato thinks if homer is a bad then what about inferior poets and aristotle replies that if homer is wrong so we can charge or we can uh, claim we can blame a uh, homer not poetry the same is here he says it's not necessary for poet to write about love if you think love to be bad then you should write against poet not poetry so there is nothing wrong with the poetry itself sydney was a chivalrous knight he was a brave knight according to the code of chivalry the woman was a goddess and love was the highest emotion that could have love is the most sincere response of a man to duty he says it is inspiration of great deed it is the moving force in all in all acts of chivalry therefore if poets are inspired by love there is nothing wrong in it so it should be admired it is something which helps the soul to get the release from the body the love of a man for a woman is the is the reflection of love of god for creation so god is love therefore sydney says that love is divine and exp and uh, and an experienced love man an exp an experienced love man comes closer to god as a result uh, it's not possible that such a thing which makes you closer to god will be bad so to love a woman because love a uh, god loves create cre creatures or a uh, god loves us man or if man gives love to woman it is the reflection of god it's not something bad that's why did he rejects this charge also here we continue the fourth charge and its reply now these critics say that it makes a man effeminate the people of today are not that strong as those of older times and its poetry which make which made them so it is said by gosan and his followers sydney asks what that old old time was in which there was no poetry because because poetry exists in old time also and today also or there was anything before poetry because poetry comes first if today poetry makes a man effeminate poetry also existed in the past in old times if someone thinks that the people of modern times are effeminate they are not so due to poetry he says that the armies of the old age used to make poet with them and they used to inspire patriotism in them how can anyone say that people of the past were not effeminate because they did not read poetry poetry has good influence on man it inspired them to great deeds so in the, he says that in the past uh, 
in all times when the armies when they uh, went to the war to fight against enemy so they would take themselves poet to inspire them to give them courage that's why he says poetry is good for the moral development and for the courage fifth charge of the gosan the fifth reply is that plato himself the fifth charge sorry not reply the fifth charge is that that plato himself condemned poet and poetry he banished poet from his ideal state or republic the other charges were not taken by sydney seriously but this charge causes a lot of difficulty for sydney because he was a great admirer of plato he loves plato and on the other hand they uh, gosan and his followers they say they plato who was one of the greatest philosopher of the time he himself condemned poets and poetry and he banished poet from his ideal republic so this was a very serious charge it was not easy to answer by sydney because he should choose one of them either he should say that plato was wrong and poetry is good or he should say that plato was right then poetry is not good so he loves both he loves poetry also and he loves plato also let's see that how he respond sydney reply he was a great admirer of plato in the defense of you sydney first say that plato did not condemn poetry as such but put but poetry he says that uh, that plato did not condemn poetry but he condemned bad poets bad poetry right he did not condemn actually poetry but he condemned bad poetry the poetry of homer which was bad in which the god and goddesses take side he can he condemn poet because they misinterpreted gods and attributed wicked deeds to heroes he condemned them for the misuse of poetry he regarded poets to be our teachers and the teaching they were given was false so that was like the ancient greek philosophy that poets they they resemble poets with teachers and there should be a good moral lesson in the uh, in the uh, poetry of poets but what did we find in the poetry of homer that was bad lesson so he said that poet that plato condemn only bad poetry not all poetry Sydney refers to the passages from Aeons by Plato where a poet is represented as inspired being in this passage Plato was ironical he meant exactly the opposite and was just making fun of the poet right so when Plato says that that that, that poet are inspired being so he Plato is making fun of the poet that they are mad people right they are not in their senses right but a uh, sydney interpreted in a way that plato mean that they are inspired man they are good man right so let's see the further explanation of this in plato time it was commonly believed that poetry is uh, that poet is an inspired being they said that the poet was a man possessed by muses plato represents in uh, in this passage that poet is inspired the mind of poet is taken away from him he is no more uh, in his senses and someone else comes to him then the other person speaks to him the poet with the normal mind cannot write uh, such beautiful poetry poetry comes from god because the poet is inspired by god this was a common belief at that time and this passage was written ironically this was not the view of plato and he refuted the common view in this way who refuted plato refuted that he is he is inspired man it means he is a madman sydney rationalized this view this is reasoning guided by emotions his emotions are his love of plato and love for poetry and the two are contradictory emotion if you love one you have to reject the other and sydney could not do so he therefore rationalized this view the scholarship of sydney's age was not great enough to understand the philosophy of plato and aristotle they were depending just on commentaries from italian and greek writers as a result sydney misinterpreted plato and his misinterpretation pleased him because he loved both plato also and poetry also his uh, his interpretation 
he he misinterpreted plato in the light of his emotions and wishes this defense of last charge is not convincing sydney should simply say that plato condemned poetry but he could be wrong this would have been a good and simple answer this objection can be answered in the light of aristotle who says that the separation of emotion is bad as compared to relief of emotion separation causes moral weakness simply uh sydney should have said that he agrees okay that uh that he agrees with this that poetry is good but plato was wrong but he couldn't say that plato was wrong because he loved plato that's why he rationalized this view and he misinterpreted plato by saying that he uh, by inspired men that he means that he gets inspiration from somewhere else and he or she when he or she uh, writes poetry so thank you so much it was all about the charges which were raised by stephen gosan who was a puritan who was originally a playwright and a poet but later on uh he quit poetry and writing and literature and he went against poet and poetry and he uh like uh, he uh, went against poet and poetry and he built some charges right he objected uh poets and poetry and the, then he dedicated and in the book where he wrote these objections he he named that book booklet the school of abuse and then the school of abuse was dedicated to philip sidney and then philip sidney in his work an apology for poetry defended poetry and given and defended poetry by answering each uh, each charge in detail so thank you so much please don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and please provide your valuable comments and feedback in the comment section thank you so much